My friends, we will get right down to where the rubber meets the road, right down where your shoe leather touches the sidewalk, right down to the nitty-gritty today. We're going to see what does it mean to walk in the Spirit. And walking in the Spirit is the principle. The Christian life is not a balloon ascension where you have some great overpowering experience and you soar to the heights. It's a daily walk, and a walk is one of the most Well, I would say rather monotonous things. It's a matter of putting one foot ahead of the other, as we're going to see here just a little later. But it's all important that we learn to walk in the Spirit. Now he's making it very clear what the works of the flesh are. We saw that's an ugly brood, a list of sensual sins, religious sins, social sins, and personal sins. And it's not a very attractive list. Now, if you go through that and find out that there is enmity in your heart today, hatred for another believer, you are living in the flesh. I mean, let's face it. There's no use beating around the bush. You can know whether you're living in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, or living in the flesh. And you know whether you are joined to a little sect or a little clique and that you judge everybody else outside of that clique, but everybody in the clique's perfect, or you think they are anyway. At least you don't say it to their face. And then are you filled with envyings? That's the work of the flesh. That's what this old natural man does. Now, having said that, he says, but the fruit of the Spirit. And I want you to notice the contrast that we have here, works of the flesh and fruit of the Spirit. Now, works of the flesh are what you do. And the Ten Commandments was given, as you can see, to control the flesh. But now the Christian life is to produce the fruit of the Spirit. Very interesting thing about fruit. The Lord Jesus talked about the fruit of the Spirit, and you have that in the 15th of the Gospel of John. He said that without him we could do nothing, (laughs) and that fruit is what he wants. He wanted fruit and more fruit and much fruit. And his desire is that we bring forth the good seed. You remember in the parable he gave, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. Now, he'd like to get us up where we could really be a fruit-bearing tree for him, or I should say a branch in the vine. And a bunch of grapes here, ooh, it has quite a few kinds of fruit that are here. Now, the Lord Jesus had a great deal to say about the fruit of the Spirit. That is what he meant in John 15. That's what he's talking about. Fruit, he says. And the fruit is produced by the Lord Jesus using the Spirit of God to produce fruit in our lives. He wants to live his life through us. That's the reason I keep saying that you are never asked to live the Christian life. You're asked to let him live it through you. And the reason is we can. This old nature of ours can't produce it. And the interesting thing is, Paul makes it clear in the seventh of Romans, the new nature has no power. He said, the will is present with me, but how to perform it I find not. And believe me, that's the problem with many of us. How do you do it? This is not a do-it-yourself thing, but... How am I going to let the Spirit of God produce the fruit of the Spirit in our lives? Now, the very interesting thing about fruit is that, and I use the illustration always of my ranch. I have a ranch up here in Pasadena. It's not what you call a big ranch. It's 72 feet wide, goes back about 123 feet, I guess. And my house where I live is right in the middle of it. And I have a nice nectarine tree out in front, and believe me, it really produces fruit. And then I have some orange trees, and they do well. I have some avocado trees, they don't do so well. And I have some guava bushes, and they do well. And I have a plum tree, and I have an apricot tree. You can see I'm quite a rancher. Four avocado trees, I have three orange trees, and I'm really in the ranching business. Now, one of the things I enjoy is going out and looking at my trees. Oh, I have a lemon tree, too. And there's never a period during the year here in California that I do not have fruit on some tree. 
Sometimes there'll be a few avocados, a lot of times oranges, and a lot of times lemons and nectarines and plums and apricots, always something. And I've observed that fruit is produced by the tree, not by effort. I just don't think, as far as I can tell, the branches get together and somehow or another that they, you know, gang up and say, now let's all of us work pretty hard and see what we can do for this fellow McGee here because he likes fruit. And I do enjoy fruit. And it's wonderful. I have some friends that send me apples each year at Christmas time, and some send me oranges. And then during the year, other kinds of fruit. And it's all delicious. I love fruit. And so these limbs, as far as I can tell, they bear fruit. They never get together. They just open up the branches there to the sunshine and to the rain, and they produce it. <laughs> They'll bloom, and then the little fruit's green, and it grows, and it becomes ripe. And that's the way it does it. Now, as far as I know, those limbs never leave the trunk of the tree either. As far as I can tell, that night, I know back New Year's Eve, I looked out around 12 o'clock, and the branches were still on the trees. I don't think they'd get down and run around. But the problem with us is, it's like this, when we offer our sacrifice to God ourselves as a living sacrifice, when the altar gets hot, I crawl off of it. And maybe you do that. And we are to abide in Christ if we are to produce fruit, we're told. The Lord Jesus now put it that way. Now, Paul is going to put it right down where you and I can get it, by the way. The fruit is produced by yielding, you see yielding to the sweet influences that are about us. And what is the sweet influence about us? Well, not this world. Why, it's the Holy Spirit that indwells us. And the Holy Spirit wants to produce the fruit. And it's called the fruit of the Spirit. And you notice it doesn't say our love, joy, peace. It's is love. Now, we can argue about the grammar but it happens to be singular in the Greek, which would indicate that love is the fruit. And from it stems all other fruit, by the way. Love is primary. Without it, Paul said, for instance, that's the purpose of 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13 wasn't ever intended to be taken out of the Bible and put in a beautiful frame and put on the wall in somebody's house. It belongs to the gifts of the Spirit. And Paul says there that the gifts are not to be exercised except by the fruit of the Spirit, which is love. And with love goes all the other fruits of the Spirit. You can't exercise a gift without doing it by the fruit of the Spirit. And love is all important. Why, he says, if you could even give your body to be burned, give everything you've got, and you have not love, you're a zero. You're nothing. You're a goose egg with a rib rubbed off of it. That's nothing. My friend, we need to recognize that today. And he makes it very clear that no gift is to be exercised by itself. And he says, love never seeks its own. 